It's time to get the speech, bubs. Make sure the facts are right. It's time to get things started on the one on one fact show tonight. Do, 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 do. Greetings, mother factors. My name is Sam, and today we're going to be learning all about the fantastically felted world of everyone's favourite Muppets. The Muppets. Whether it's Kermit's wiggly arms, animals, gnarly drumming, or Gonzo's beautifully curled snout, phew, the Muppets have something for everybody, so quit your belly aching and get hyped for some fuzzy facts. But which Muppet had their own brand of cereal? How was the success of the Muppets helped by a Soviet ballet dancer? And do you think Gonzo likes me? I feel like he barely knows I exist. <clears throat> anyway, two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so grab some snacks, get comfy, and prepare to get fussed as we take you through 101 facts about the Muppets. Number one. The Muppets are an ensemble group of lovable puppet characters created in 1955 by Jim and Jane Henson, as well as the namesake of the media franchise associated with the characters, which encompasses television, music, film, and other media. Oh. Number two. The Muppets are known for their goofy, slapstick, self-aware, and meta-referential style of humour. Yeah, we're using long words here. Producing a wide variety of comedy ranging from absurd, anarchic sketches <laughs> to long-form, kooky narratives, becoming more sincere on occasion. Number three. Interestingly, Henson studied at the University of Maryland in the hope of becoming a commercial artist, and never really intended to pursue puppetry as a career. In his first year, however, he was asked to create a five minute long puppet show for WRC TV named Sam and Friends, which aired from May of 1955 to December of 1961, and formed the earliest inspiration for what would later become the Muppets. Number four. Developed by Henson and his eventual wife Jane Nabell, one of his biggest innovations seen on Sam and Friends was arranging the scenes so that the people controlling the puppets could not be seen. The show was also notable for being the first form of puppet media not to utilise a traditional proscenium arch within which the characters are presented, you know, like Punch and Judy style. Instead, the show relied on the natural framing of the camera shot, creating a more naturalistic environment. And yes, we are going this deep on the Muppets. Number 5. Henson also made the puppets more soft and flexible than many of the other puppets previously seen on TV, which were often made of cold, hard wood. This made it possible for Henson's puppets to express a far wider range of emotions and expressions, which is good when you're trying to get people to enjoy the company of an inanimate object. Number 6. Sam and Friends featured a prototype of Kermit the Frog. Kermit the Frog! And yes, you'll be hearing that impression multiple times through this video. Lucky you. This prototype was created using fabric from a discarded spring coat owned by Henson's mother and two halves of a ping pong ball for eyes, as all the best puppets are. Number 7. Kermit was initially conceived as less of a frog and more of a lizard-like creature without a specific species, and made a number of TV appearances before his status as a frog was established and solidified. In fact, Kermit didn't get his frogginess until the 1960s. Number 8. In 2010, the original Kermit the Frog puppet was put on permanent display at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., along with various other Sam and Friends characters. It's in good, if not quite strange, company, sharing space with Abraham Lincoln's top hat and a sofa from the set of The Oprah Winfrey Show. Now, there's a sitcom I'd like to see, those three guys living together. Number 9. Another early Muppet is Rolf the Dog, who was originally created in 1962 for a Purina Dog Chow commercial, which aired in Canada until 1963. According to Henson's note, other names considered for Rolf included Barkley, Woofington, Barkus, Howlington, Waggington, and Beowulf. Wow, that got highbrow real quick. Number 10. From his humble beginnings flogging pet food to Canadians, Rolf made several appearances on late night talk shows and in advertising during the 1960s, and eventually became the first Muppet character to bag a regular slot on network television when he began appearing alongside Jimmy Dean on The Jimmy Dean Show. Number 11. During his run on The Jimmy Dean Show between 1963 and 66, Rolf received more fan mail than Jimmy Dean himself. People just like puppets more than they like humans, it's true. Especially if it's a dog puppet. In fact, I'm considering becoming a dog puppet just so Jennifer Lawrence will love me. Number 12. Because Jimmy Dean did so much to promote the Muppets, Henson actually offered him a cut of the profits. Dean refused though, claiming that Jim did all the work and deserved all the credit. Ah, wholesome. Number 13. In 1963, Henson and his new wife Jane moved to New York City, where they formed Muppets Incorporated. When his wife stopped working on the puppets to raise their children, Henson hired Frank Oz and Jerry Jewell, both of whom became important figures in the development and success of the Muppets. Number 14. In 1969, television producer Joan Gans Cooney approached Henson and his staff with an offer, an offer to work full-time on a little educational children's show she'd co-created by the name of Sesame Street. No, but I've never heard of it either. The show debuted in 1969, and though Henson's puppets initially appeared in their own separate section, they were quickly integrated with the realistic segments and given greater prominence on the show. Number 15. At around this time, Kermit's frilled collar was added too, both to make him look more frog-like, although I don't understand how, and to hide the seam between his head and body. 
Back in those days, the scenes on puppets were considered obscene, akin to profanity or full frontal nudity. It was a simpler time. Number 16. In 1970, the popular Muppet Gonzo made his first appearance in the TV special The Great Santa Claus Switch, though under the name Snarl. Gonzo has since become a favourite among Muppet fans, who idolise his alluring blue fur and swoon over his elegantly curved nose. God damn it, apparently Gonzo's hot. Number 17. Early versions of the sassy, brassy Miss Piggy made appearances on TV shows like The Tonight Show and Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Today, Miss Piggy is known for her elegant sophistication and violent tendencies. Number 18. Miss Piggy was originally named Miss Piggy Lee after Peggy Lee, who was the favourite singer of Muppet designer Bonnie Erickson's mother. As the show became more well known, however, the name was shortened so not to offend Peggy Lee. Number 19. In the mid-70s, Henson began developing a weekly TV series starring the Muppets, but the idea was consistently rejected by American networks who believed it could only appeal to children. Well, however, he later pitched the show to British impresario Lou Grade, who agreed to finance the Muppets show, prompting Henson to leave Sesame Street and move to London. Number 20, yeah, ooh, ah, hmm, hmm, hmm. Henson was then offered a deal to produce the show by the British commercial station ATV. Set in a fictional theatre in New York City, The Muppet Show was filmed at ATV Studios in Elstree, England, broadcast in the UK by ITV and then sold to the United States as part of a syndication deal. Yep, that's right, so The Muppet Show technically is English. Sam the Eagle would be sick. Number 21. Because The Muppet Show was filmed in London, it was one of the few TV shows not affected by the 1980 Screen Actors Strike, which delayed the start of that year's TV season. Number 22. <laughs> The first episode of The Muppet Show premiered in September of 1976. While children enjoyed watching all the fuzzy characters they recognised from Sesame Street, most of the actual jokes were written with adults in mind. In fact, one of the pilots of the show was titled The Muppet Show Sex and Violence, as a nod to the proliferation of sex and violence on television. Number 23. Initially, the producers had a lot of difficulty getting guest stars to come on the show, but this changed pretty much immediately after the Soviet ballet dancer Rudolf Nureyev agreed to appear. Having such a renowned ballet dancer perform on a bizarre show like The Muppets created so much positive publicity that soon celebrities were lining up for guest appearances. That's right, you can thank classical ballet for the success of The Muppets. Number 24. Originally, the producers of The Muppet Show intended to create Muppet versions of each guest star, but this practice was scrapped after only the third episode. This was because creating Muppet versions of every single guest star was time-consuming and very expensive. Plus, they didn't like their hands being shoved up because it's like voodoo, isn't it? I just feel weird. Number 25. Kermit was not the original host of The Muppet Show. That honour belongs to Nigel, the orchestra conductor, who hosted the aforementioned Sex and Violence pilot. He was dropped after being deemed too wimpy. Too wimpy? <laughs> That's ridiculous. He was dropped after being deemed too wimpy to host the show. Unlike Kermit the Frog, of course, who is an unstoppable man of action and a model of masculinity. <laughs> that is among the most ridiculous facts we've ever had. Number 26. Originally as well, Miss Piggy was only supposed to be a minor character on The Muppet Show, but her quirky obsession with Kermit, as well as her extreme delusions of grandeur, guaranteed her a spot as one of the main characters on the show. Oh yeah! Number 27. Oh, good. <laughs> the adorable Fozzie Bear was named after Jim Henson's right-hand man, Frank Oz. Is what an incorrect person would say, whoa Holler at your boy! This popular canard is untrue, as Fozzie Bear was actually named for Faz Fasakas, the special effects designer and puppeteer who created the mechanism that allowed Fozzie Bear to wiggle his ears. Number 28. However, Fozzie Bear does get some of his personality from Oz. Fozzie's comic persona often includes examples of Jewish humour. Wagga wagga! Because he was originally performed by Oz, who is in fact both Jewish and humorous. Number 29. The creation of Animal. Ha ha ha! Honestly, I'm, I can nail the Muppets. That, that sounds weird out of context. The creation of Animal, a taciturn Muppet with prodigious drumming ability, was inspired by the drummer of the Who, Keith Moon. Is what an incorrect person would say. Oh! There is no evidence in the original artwork to suggest that the character was based on Moon, and designers have denied that Animal is based on anyone in particular. Number 30. The Swedish chef was a favourite of Henson and Oz too, principally because the two performed him together, with Henson steering the head and providing the voice, while Oz controlled the hands. I Number 31. The Swedish chef is incidentally the only character to have bare human hands, presumably because of the dexterity needed to cook. If you can call it cooking, the crazy kook, or cook, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on edge. His human hands are really quite disturbing when you look at them for too long. Number 32. Using the lid of his cooking pot as a shield, the Swedish chef is the only person to have blocked one of Miss Piggy's fearsome karate chops. I guess having five digits on each hand instead of the four does have its benefits. Number 33. 
Actual real-life Swedish people, it's true they exist, I've met them, claim that the Swedish chef sounds far more Norwegian, and even refer to the character as the Norwegian chef. Number 34. Everyone's favourite geriatric hecklers, Statler and Waldorf, are named after two well-known New York City hotels. The Statler Hilton, which is now the Hotel Pennsylvania, and the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Waldorf also has a wife called Astoria, who oddly enough looks suspiciously like someone else. Keeping up appearances indeed. Number 35. The character of Floyd Pepper got his name from the band Pink Floyd and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Cup Band, an album by the Beatlers. His outfit and moustache are also similar to those of the Beatles from their Lonely Hearts Club band Personas. Number 36. The largest of all the Muppets is Thog, an enormous blue monster with a friendly disposition, standing tall at just under 3 metres, as well as being 1.2 metres wide. Number 37. There is a lesser known Muppet called Venderface, who is essentially a sarcastic, irascible and sometimes violent vending machine. Venderface was initially planned to be used in only one sketch, but ultimately proved so expensive to construct that executive producer David Laser, brilliant name by the way, insisted it be used several times more. Number 38. Kermit the Frog and Wardorf are the only characters to appear in all 120 episodes of The Muppet Show. Which veteran Muppet do you prefer? The classic green leading frog Kermit or the slanderous old curmudgeon Wardorf? Let us know in our fuzzy YouTube poll. Number 39. Over 100 guest stars have appeared on The Muppet Show throughout its six-year run, with no celebrity ever appearing more than once. Number 40. Guest stars on The Muppet Show can actually request to appear in a scene with their favourite Muppet. Apparently, the most requested Muppet co-star was Miss Piggy, with Animal coming in as a close second. Number 41. As a result of its anarchic shenanigans and light-hearted fuzzy hijinks, The Muppet Show ultimately won four Primetime Emmy Awards. Four! You can count them on one Muppet hand. The meaning of life. In 1979, Frank Oz provided a detailed biography of Miss Piggy to the New York Times. Oz stated that Miss Piggy grew up in a small town in Iowa, and that her father had died when she was young, leaving her alone with a mother who wasn't particularly nice to her. As a result of her turbulent childhood, Miss Piggy had to enter beauty contests to survive. Jeez, that is a dark backstory for a Muppet. What next, Kermit's a smack addict? I mean, God. Number 43. As the Muppets grew in popularity, the characters were naturally localised for international markets where languages other than English are spoken. I know, I can't believe they exist either. Consequently, many of the characters are known by different names in certain countries. For example, in most of Latin America, Kermit is known as René, while in Spain he's called Gustavo. His name in Arabic is Kamel, which is a common Arabic male name meaning perfect, and in Hungary, he goes by the name Breki. Number 44. During the 70s and 80s, the Muppets diversified their reach across the media landscape by expanding into theatrical feature films, the first of which was released in 1979, simply titled The Muppet Movie. The film follows Kermit, or Brecky, or Camel, or whatever the hell he's called today, Gustavo, I don't know, as he embarks on a cross-country trip to Hollywood, while being pursued by an evil restaurateur who wants to enlist Kermit as a spokesperson for his edible frog's legs. <laughs> oh, the Muppets. Number 45. In order to film the opening scene of Kermit the Frog in the Swamp, Jim Henson had to spend an entire day underwater inside a specially designed 50-gallon diving bell, accompanied by a monitor and an oxygen tube. He then stuck out his arm through a rubber sleeve to control Kermit while remaining hidden. Number 46. In fact, the opening scene in which Gustavo the Frog plays the banjo and sings while sitting on a log took five entire days to film. Five days stuck underwater with your hand up a frog's backside. If that isn't commitment to puppetry, I don't know what is. Number 47. The unbelievably beautiful song which Kermit sings while sitting on his log called Rainbow Connection is actually probably one of my favourite songs of all time, but ultimately reached number 25 on the Billboard Hot 100 music chart. That was in November of 1979 and it remained in the top 40 for seven weeks. Have you been half asleep? And have you heard voices? I've heard them calling my name. Number 48. Not only that, Rainbow Connection was even nominated for a Best Song at the 52nd Academy Awards in 1980, though it sadly lost to Normal Rain's It Goes Like It Goes, a very famous song which everyone definitely remembers. Number 49. The story of Kermit heading to Hollywood was written as an allegory for Jim Henson's own rise to fame. I am slightly unsure how Kermit's attempt to elude a ruthless frog legs magnate fits into that, unless Henson himself was pursued by proprietor of a human meat restaurant. Could happen, you never know. Hollywood's crazy. Number 50. Towards the end of the film, Animal eats Dr. Bunsen Honeydew's Instagrow pills and balloons through the roof of an old wooden building, scaring off Doc Hopper and his cronies. Wanting the moment to be real as possible, Henson refused to use camera trickery or a miniature set to create the scene, forcing his crew to construct a gigantic animal head for real. Number 51. 
The closing reprise of Rainbow Connection is sung by a crowd of more than 250 Muppets, which require the production to enlist the help of 137 additional puppeteers from the Los Angeles Guild of the Puppeteers of America. Number 52. To produce the final scene, the combined team of approximately 150 puppeteers stood in a huge pit, which measured roughly 5 meters wide and a little under 2 meters deep. Amazingly, the team managed to complete the scene in only one day. Number 53. In 2009, 30 years after the film's release, the Muppet movie was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress, and thus selected for preservation in the National Film Registry. Number 54. 1981 saw the release of the second Muppets film, enticingly titled The Great Muppet Caper. The film followed the Muppets to London to prevent a jewel heist, and constitutes Jim Henson's feature directorial debut. Number 55. That title could have been worse as the film had some truly uninspired working titles such as Muppet Mania or even The Muppet Movie 2. Jim Henson enlisted friends, relatives, and staff members to help come up with a title for the movie, before the winning title was suggested by Henson's 19-year-old daughter Lisa. Number 56. The scene with Kermit's dancing shadow took an excruciating 43 takes to get right. Apparently, lining up a dancing puppet with an independently moving shadow is difficult. Who knew? Number 57. In 1984, the third Muppet movie was released, entitled The Muppets Take Manhattan. The film follows Kermit and his buddies as they literally take Manhattan using a complex series of legal loopholes to evict every single New Yorker out of their homes. Psych! It's actually about the Muppets encountering financial issues while attempting to stage a Broadway show. I mean, I kind of prefer my version, but whatever. <coughs> Number 58. The kennel at which Ralph is working has several labelled cages, two of which are labelled Jim and Frank, in honour of the film's creators, Jim Henson and Frank Oz. Number 59. The Muppets Take Manhattan contains the first appearance of the Muppet Babies, who appear in a dream sequence in which Miss Piggy imagines what it could have been like had she and Kermit grown up together. The animated series based on this sequence premiered only two months after The Muppets Take Manhattan was released. Number 60. Episodes of The Muppet Babies ran for 30 minutes, though the show was often aired in 60 or even 90 minute blocks, following the cancellation of Garbage Pale Kids, as CBS had nothing else to fill the empty space in the schedule. Number 61. In 1989, The Muppets starred in another TV series called The Jim Henson Hour. The show featured many of Henson's most famous characters, but was ultimately cancelled after one season due to low ratings. Number 62. Jim Henson performed on television with Kermit the Frog for the last time on the 4th of May 1990, during an episode of the Arsenio Hall Show. Less than two weeks later, Henson passed away on the 16th of May 1990, at the age of 53. It was later determined that Henson's sudden death was the result of organ dysfunction caused by streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. Number 63. He left behind quite the legacy, I'm sure we can all agree. In fact, throughout his career, Jim Henson reportedly created over 2,000 different Muppets, which is loads, loads of Muppets. Nintendo 64. In 1996, the Muppets continued their television careers with Muppets Tonight. The show was based around a variety talk show hosted by a Muppet called Clifford, who was originally the bassist for Solid Foam, the band on the Jim Henson Hour. Number 65. Apparently, the decision to have Clifford as the host was made because Jim Henson had requested that in the event of his death, any future Muppet show would not be hosted by Kermit the Frog. Number 66. In 1992, humanity was gifted with one of the greatest Christmas movies in existence, namely The Muppet Christmas Carol. Based on the 1843 novella A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, this is the very first Muppet movie in which Kermit the Frog isn't the lead. Number 67. Upon accepting the role as Ebenezer Scrooge, English actor Mark O'Kane stated that he would approach the role as if he were working with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and that he would treat his performance as an utterly dramatic role, specifically stating he would never do anything Muppety. Number 68. Since appearing in the film, Michael Caine has stated that he considers the role of Scrooge to be one of his most memorable roles, and that he watches it every year with his children. Number 69. This feels inappropriate. In the film's first scene, there is a shop sign that reads Duncan and Kenworthy, which is a direct reference to Duncan Kenworthy, a producer who worked on several Jim Henson Company projects, including The Dark Crystal and Fraggle Rock. Number 70. There is a red pub that can be seen at several points in the film, especially towards the end, that bears the names Statler and Waldorf. This is an obvious nod to the gang's most beloved aging libelists, well, Statler and Waldorf, who are also in the film as Marley and Marley. Ooh. Number 71. In 1996, the world was graced with yet another cinematic classic in the form of Muppet Treasure Island, which, as you can probably deduce, was adapted from the 1883 adventure novel written by Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson. The lead character of Jim Hawkins is played by English comedian Kevin Bishop, who was only 16 when it was released. Number 72. Rock stars Mick Jagger and David Bowie were both seriously considered for the role of Long John Silver before Tim Curry was cast. Bowie did go on to work with Henson, though, in Labyrinth. Ah, oh, Bowie is Long John Silver. Walk the plank, why don't you? Number 73. 
Oh, okay. That, that could have been either of them, to be fair. Tim Curry has been a huge fan of the Muppets for years before appearing in this movie. Who hasn't? And has stated in many interviews he regards his role as Long John Silver as one of his all-time faves. Although he used the word favourite. Number 74. Curry based his voice as Long John Silver on that of his grandfather. Number 75. After shooting was completed, Curry was given a Muppet made in his likeness as Long John Silver, which is frankly the best gift anyone can receive. I mean, of themselves, not just of Long John Silver. Number 76. Bishop was deep in the midst of puberty during filming, which rendered the tone and quality of his voice somewhat inconsistent. As a result, the filmmakers were forced to overdub his singing performances with older recordings of the songs. Damn you, testosterone. Number 77. Hormel Foods Corporation, the illustrious makers of everyone's favourite meat-based food block Spam, sued Jim Henson Productions for naming one of the film's pig characters Spam. Unable to prove any damages, their suit was dismissed on the 22nd of September 1995, with the judge noting that one might think Hormel would welcome the association with a genuine source of pork. Ho <laughs> ho You get him, sis. Number 78. In 1999, the Muppets appeared in Muppets from Space, in which Gonzo attempts to uncover his origins following a series of disturbing nightmares. Muppets from Space is notable for being the only non-musical Muppets movie. Number 79. Muppets from Space is also the first Muppets film in which the rods used to control the arms of the Muppets were digitally removed in post-production, a technique that has since been used in subsequent Muppet productions. Groundbreaking stuff. Number 80. At one point in the film, Kermit the Frog can be seen reading the Hensonville News Observer, an obvious affectionate reference to Jim Henson. Number 81. Katie Holmes and Joshua Jackson, two of the principal actors from the classic American teen drama series Dawson's Creek, managed to score cameos in the film because their show was being filmed on a neighbouring soundstage. Sometimes, miracles do happen. Number 82. In February 2004, Disney acquired the Muppets, guaranteeing that the franchise would receive broader public exposure than in previous years. Jim Henson had been in negotiations with Disney since the late 80s, but progress on the deal had stalled following Henson's death. Number 83. Under Disney, the Muppets experienced revitalized success and starred in new films like their 2011 outing simply entitled The Muppets, a film that I genuinely love. The film starred Jason Segel and Amy Adams, as well as numerous other A-listers including but not limited to Rashida Jones, Jack Black, Zach Galifianakis, Donald Glover, Sarah Silverman, Jim Parsons, and Ken Jeong, though sadly, goddess of beauty Jennifer Lawrence does not make an appearance in the film. The Muppets raked in over $165 million in worldwide sales, making it the most lucrative Muppet film ever made. Number 84. In order to maintain the original charm of our felted friends, the filmmakers behind the Muppets were determined not to use CGI or camera trickery to create the film, and utilised only traditional techniques for the Muppet effects, such as remote-controlled and battery-operated puppets. Number 85. In the scene in Kermit's office, numerous photos of him with various celebrities can be seen. One of those photos is with Jim Henson, another loving tribute to his creator. Number 86. The day before the film was released on DVD, the Muppets were awarded a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The star is located in front of the El Capitan Theatre, which is owned by Disney and serves as the Muppet Theatre in the film. Number 87. At one point in the movie, Kermit is asked whether or not he's a Ninja Turtle. This is another affectionate reference to Jim Henson, who was responsible for the animatronics in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. Ah, bet you didn't know that, did ya? Number 88. Emily Blunt's cameo in the film is a deliberate spoof of her iconic role as a raging fashion B-word in The Devil Wears Prada. Number 89. The Muppets was the first of the Muppets productions to win an Oscar, as the New Zealand actor Brett McKenzie, known for his role in the musical comedy Flight of the Concord, won the award for Best Original Song with Man or Muppet. Number 90. Lou Zealand, a Muppet known for his old-timey rough and boomerang fish, has appeared in every major Muppet movie. He's also had a speaking role in all of them except for Muppet Treasure Island. Number 91. The most recent Muppet film is 2014's musical comedy Muppets Most Wanted, which stars the likes of Ricky Gervais, Tina Fey, and Ty Burrell. Taking inspiration from previous Muppet movies like The Great Muppet Caper and The Muppets Take Manhattan, as well as other classic crime comedies like The Pink Panther, Muppets Most Wanted follows the gang in their attempts to foil yet another jewel heist in London. God, why can't everyone leave our crown jewels alone? Number 92. Ricky Gervais and Danny Trejo were originally meant to appear in The Muppets, but their cameos were ultimately cut from the film. Luckily, they got a second chance and later appeared in Muppets Most Wanted, with Gervais getting his cameo bumped up to a role as one of the main characters. Number 93. Towards the end of the delightful musical jaunt with doing a sequel, Walter suggests calling the movie The Muppets Again. This was actually the film's original working title all the way through filming, but it was changed at the last minute to Muppets Most Wanted. Number 94. Today, the Muppets have enjoyed a successful career spanning six decades and are widely considered as pop culture icons all around the world. The Fuzzy Friends have won recognition from numerous cultural institutions and organizations, such as the American Film Institute and the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Number 95. 
The Swedish chef had his own cereal, hilariously named Crunchy Stars, with an obligatory Germanic umlaut over the first O. Crunchy Stars were first distributed by the Post Cereal Company in 1988, but the cereal was sadly discontinued a year later. Number 96. If you thought the Muppets would stop at cereals, you are sorely mistaken, my pure, innocent, naive children. In 2006, Kermit published a self-help book titled Before You Leap, a frog's eye view of life's greatest lessons. The book was ghostwritten by Jim Lewis, a frequent Muppet writer, and was later reconfigured in 2012 to appeal to a younger audience. Number 97. The original voice and movement of the beloved Star Wars character Yoda was provided by Frank Oz. The role was initially offered to Henson, but he ultimately declined the role and suggested his frequent collaborator instead. However, Henson did still consult on the creation of the character. Number 98. In 1998, Animal was named as the official mascot of the US ski team in that year's Winter Olympics. Why? Because the entire team were also drummers. I made that up, I'm sorry, I just wanted to sound interesting. Number 99. Miss Piggy has appeared on the cover of a total of six magazines, including People, TV Guide, and Life, the latter of which proclaimed Miss Piggy for president in 1980. Sadly, Miss Piggy lost to Republican candidate Ronald Reagan. <sighs> Someday we'll find it. Number 100. In 2008, Kermit joined a team of conservationists in a visit to Washington, D.C., where he spoke to Congress about the association of zoos and aquariums and the importance of protecting endangered amphibians. This makes Kermit the Frog the only amphibian American to ever testify before the United States Congress. This is what we call Act 101. Muppet puppeteers often use their right hand to operate the head, while operating the rod with their left hand. This means that most Muppets are actually left-handed. Yeah, but you didn't think about that before, did you? Well, you do now, and that was 101 Facts About the Muppets. Which Muppet's your favourite? Which Muppet movie is your favourite? Are you a man or a Muppet? Let me know all those things in the comments down below, give this video a like, and subscribe to 101 Facts if you haven't done so already. In the meantime, though, my god, look at that. Two videos on screen for you right now. Click on one of them, go on, you're gonna love it. And until next time, bye bye